Hello, good afternoon. Ash from London here um, with another top 10 and it's another genre top 10 today. Um, going to be talking about grunge. Now, I was, uh, this was also a bit of a request. Uh, someone asked me to do this a while ago now and uh, I've just got around to doing it. But um, yeah, grunge, what a exciting episode in the history of rock music. Eh? It was a really, really cool time. Um, I'm lucky enough to be of a certain age to have experienced quite a lot of musical revolutions right from the um, early 70s to present day. And grunge was one of them. Um, it was um, centred in Seattle, in Washington State, uh, up there in Northwest America. And um, it, happening around the uh, end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, it was interesting because uh, at the same time, I was living in Manchester in the UK, and uh, we had the Manchester scene going on there. And uh, I was thinking, if living in Seattle during that period must have been the same as in Manchester. It was that local musical revolution going on. It must have been quite an exciting um, place to be at the time. But uh, I was en happily enjoying the Manchester scene, and I uh, got into the grunge scene as well. So it's all good. Um, I actually went to Seattle in '92 um, when you know the gr grunge was real. You know top of everyone's mind it was just um you know like i say a great time but there was um not much happening in seattle itself but i think most of the bands were uh out conquering the rest of the world so anyway yeah uh grunge i, was, I did a bit of research on the term grunge because um, in the early days i don't remember hearing it much you know like around about 88 89 when i first got into that kind of music i don't remember the term grunge um, being used much and uh did a bit of research, and apparently it was first used in 1987 by a music journalist, and it was used to describe the music of the Seattle band Green River. Um, so, there you go. It does have that kind of sludgy, fuzzy, distorted guitar sound about it in the main. Um, the influences obviously come from uh, punk rock, uh, hardcore punk, a lot of the early garage bands like the MC5, the Stooges, all that Detroit sound. Um and a bit of heavy metal as well, I suppose. Um, the, I think that that's why it went it went so big because it kind of appealed to a lot of people. He um, he got all the, all the hardcore punks were into it. Um, all the indie kids, uh, like myself, were kind of into it because it, it bands like the Pixies and Sonic Youth. It kind of like followed along with those, those kind of sounds. And I think you know um, a lot of the fans. Um, moved on to grunge and see, so it's another indie kind of thing. It was an independent label, I mean, a sub pop with the main label in Seattle, and a lot of the bands recorded their earlier stuff on that. And it also appealed to the heavy metal crowd as well, um, to the point where uh, Nirvana were invited to um, join Guns N' Roses on their usual illusion tour, which is, um, I think they turned down politely, but um, yeah, which was good. I don't think it would have been a good fit for Guns N' Roses, but. Um, but anyway, so there you go. So anyway, um, what I've got here is a top ten. I've chosen um, a mixture of albums and EPs, really. Um, but it's more like top ten bands as such. Um, but like a lot of these videos, they do tend to be a bit the same. I mean, um, I think I mentioned during my prog rock ten, I wanted to mix it up and change it a bit, so you're not seeing the same um, albums and artists all the time. But this year, we'll, we'll probably see the same artists that are in uh, other people's grunge lists. But um, I've tried to mix up a bit here, and I've thrown in a couple of wild cards, so just to sort, yeah, keep keep things fresh, spice things up. Um, as usual, this is just my opinion um, from my personal experience of. Um, moving through the genre as it was happening things that um, got my attention things that i really liked above others everyone has their own opinion so you know yeah, happy to put your um, version of events in the comments below so anyway okay let's uh, start off this little um top 10 of grunge shall we um now of course i mentioned seattle seattle was the epicenter uh, and there were four main bands uh, well the big four they call them the big four of grunge that was the big four of something uh, big four grunge being Pearl Jam, Nirvana, Soundgarden, and Alice in Chains. Alice in Chains were one band I never really got into as much as the others. I kind of like them. I've seen them a couple of times live. Got some of their albums, and um, I kind of thought, well, they need to be in this in, in this ten. So um, I decided to start the ten with one of their releases. Uh, gave a lot of their stuff a listen recently, and one EP which really um, has captured my attention again recently is uh, their 1994 release, Jar of Flies. I never know how to hold these to stop the reflection. Uh, which is really, really intriguing EP. It's um, their third EP release. It was their fifth release overall. Uh, they were um, one of the big stars at the time because they'd just released their, previously released their um, 
Dirt album, which was a big, uh, big hit for them. And this was a huge seller as well. It actually reached number one in the in the album charts. The first EP to ever do that. But it's really cool. Like the other EPs, it's predominantly acoustic and um, even features um, string quartet on some of the tracks, which is uh, one of the reasons. Another reason I've chosen it to show that kind of other side of um, the grunge kind of sound. It was um, wasn't all the shouty, noisy stuff. It was a lot of um, more introspective, quieter moments, and. Um, and very melodic as well. Um, it's very, it's still a very haunting, dark album. There's a lot of dark lyrics. This is a kind of a haunting sound about it. I've listened to it quite a bit, like I say, on, on the old headphones. But um, I just thought, you know, it'd be a good good way to start this uh, this ten, and a good way to feature Alice in Chains. And they're still around, uh, playing a lot of the festivals and things these days. So, and yeah, it comes in at number ten. Uh, my grunge ten here. Alice in Chains, Jar of Flies from 1994. Okay, right. The first of the wild cards to be thrown in here. Uh, this is a band that's not normally associated with grunge, but uh, I think they should be. Um, musically, they kind of fit into that in some ways. They're a bit more punk. Uh, one of the, the credentials are pretty high for the uh, grunge thing because they're from Olympia in Washington, which is not far from Seattle. Uh, they were around the same time as the grunge was going on. They were also part of another... Uh, movement that was happening called the Riot Girl Movement, which was a feminist movement um, featuring music, theatre, all kinds of things, which I have I have discussed on an earlier video. Um, um, and this band, I think, should be in this top ten. The band is Bikini Kill, and this is their uh, self-released album, first album, Revolution Girl Style Now. Um... Which is released on tape. Uh, this isn't one of the original tapes. I imagine the original tapes are quite collectible now, but it was all all self released, self recorded, self produced. Um, I think just as important as um, musicians, writers, slogan writers, and um, whatever with with the girl, right girl movement was uh, people with access to photocopiers because everything was uh, lots of leaflets and posters and things and cassettes um, covers. But yeah, this this is really really cool. It's um, very raw, very um, very um, immediate, kind of uh, thrown together. I wouldn't like to use use the term amateurish, but because it, it, it's art, it's absolutely it's, you know, it's absolutely brilliant. Really sort of like caught the moment. And I really um, just got, got into them. I really I really love the DIY approach, all that photocopying and doing their own stuff. And it was just just it's just really really cool. Um, they, uh, the, the, the reason I mentioned in an earlier video was because I did um, a video about um, rock biographies and um, there was a book by uh, Sarah Marcus called Girls to the Front which um, was all about the Riot Girl movement in general but um, quite a lot about Bikini Kill in there. There was another band called Bratmobile who were around about the same time and this spread to the UK as well. There was a band called Huggy Bear, for, uh, the UK Riot Girl band. But it was just really, really good. I mean, really good funny. It would have been cool to have been around and see it all happening that kind of real, and um, it was almost like punk rock all over again, but I've decided to fit it in with the grunge top ten <coughs> as, as uh, my first wild card. And um, there we go. It, uh, the album has been released re re um, later on vinyl and on CD. I saw it on CD recently, actually. I think they've got a newer CD out now where it's uh, doubled up with another one of their albums as well, but um, definitely uh, worth looking into. It's available for streaming as well. Um, Bikini Kill. Revolution Girl Style Now. From 1991. That's number 9 in my grunge 10. Okay, number 8. Um, one of the big four. Um, this band have gone from strength to strength. They're still around. They're still um, headlining arenas and stadiums and festivals and things. Uh, it's Pearl Jam and um, the debut album 10, uh, also from 1991. Um, this album tends to feature quite near the top of a lot of these uh, grunge things uh, with me. I absolutely loved it and played to death at the time. I actually bought this in Seattle. I bought it on tape originally. I was doing my travelling back then and I, uh, it just became another one of those uh, travelling soundtracks for me. Um, I still think it's their best album. They've released quite a lot since, obviously. Um, I've seen them in concert, they're a great band to see live, but there's something about them that I just there's not as immediate as they used to be. I've sort of like uh, I've not gone off them, but they've just gone down a little bit. You know, uh, they're not as exciting. I, don't, I, I listened to it. I gave it another spin just to make sure I still like I still like it. Some great tracks on it, <coughs> but um, 
it seems to have lost a bit of its sheen over the over the years, I think. But I've got some great happy memories with it, particularly on the road, because it's got some of their best known songs in here: "Once," "Eden," "Flow," "Alive." You know, some great great tracks. Uh, I got I bought this one. I had it on tape, like I said. When I got back to Europe, I bought it on um, on CD, and it's got some uh, extra tracks on here. Apparently, there's a live version of "Alive" and a couple of other a couple of other um, outtakes stuck on the end there. One track in particular, I remember when I was travelling, was Black. This is um, track five on this, which is a mellower track. I was in uh, Toronto in Canada and I decided to go and visit Niagara Falls. So I got the train down to Niagara Falls and I was listening to this and um, it was a really miserable grey day and I was thinking, oh God, do a, is this a good day to go and see the, the falls? Because it was just miserable, it was raining, dark, you know. And I was just listening to this and the, the track Black came on and kind of captured the mood almost. I was looking, looking out the window as I, on my way down there. But um, I still visited the falls, it was still a good day and it... Um, I don't know. This became the soundtrack for my visit to Niagara Falls. So when I hear that track, I always think of that that time on the train. So um, there you go. That's a little little thing. So there, there we go. So that's uh, Pearl Jam coming at number eight with our album ten from nineteen ninety one. My grunge top ten. Time for another wild card, number seven. Well, this won't be a such a surprise if anyone saw my P J Harvey album ranking a while ago. I mentioned this album, which was their second release, Rid of Me, saying then, I call this a grunge album. Okay, it's uh, the only non-American um, band on the uh, on the list, so I thought, well, punk rock, glam rock, all the other genres, they all, well, Riot Girl, all spread across the pond to the UK, so why not grunge? So um, I've chosen this as the Wildcard Grunge album, released in 1993, um, if you want to know more about it, uh, check out my PJ Harvey ranking. You'll check out some uh, good other stuff as well. PJ Harvey at the time was also the name of the trio, the, the band, uh, with, um, with the two um, uh, Rob, Rob Ellis on drums and what was it, the guy called Steve Vaughan on bass. Uh, they did the first one, but then she went, they became, did an Alice Cooper and became a solo, <laughs> a solo artist using the same name later. But, um, but yeah, it was, it was re re really, really good. I mean, um, it was a Steve Albini production, so it's got that real raw sound. You had Steve Albini, the uh, Pixies, Breeders, Nirvana, Big Black. So it had, it had the, those kind of credentials as well. So, um, And it's um, quite different to her um, early stuff. It's very raw, very aggressive, almost very, um, I don't know. And it was even got a grungy looking um, sleeve as well. So I think it deserves to be classed as a grunge album. Don't know whether PJ herself would uh, agree on that, but there you go. Anyway, I put it as my wild card. It's number seven in my grunge top ten. Rid of me, nineteen ninety-three. Okay, another female band here. Uh, these had to be in here. Um, band is L Seven. I couldn't decide which album to do. I was toss tossing up between um, Bricks Are Heavy and this one, which I decided to do. Smell the magic. Which started life as an EP. So um, this was released in 1990. It's on a sub pop label. Uh, look at that. So that's, that's typical of a grunge concert, I think, back in the day. You know, uh, not quite sure what's going on. The band are crowd surfing there. There's guitars and all kinds of things going on. But uh, yeah, this, like I say, this was originally an EP. This is a, the later release, uh, which was expanded into more of an album length. There's uh, three extra tracks. I did on, but this is just brilliant. I mean, um, L7, great, great band. Uh, Bricks Are Heavy is, is, is as good, but I think there's something about this one. It's got, it's got really, really grungy, crisp, grungy sounding guitar tones. Um, beautifully recorded, but production is really good. Who produced this? Uh, who produced this? Produced, well, produced, self produced by the band. Brilliant. So, um, yeah. Just really, really cool. I mean, you've got tracks like Shove. Fast and Frightening, right on through, Death Wish. Brilliant, this absolutely, absolutely steamrolls along. Uh, really snarly vocals as well. Now, the, the vocals are shared um, shared by three band members, actually. Danita, Danita Sparks and Susie Gardner, who are the guitarists, uh, they, they sing on um, on tracks, uh, take it to uh, sing lead on tracks. And then uh, Jennifer Finch, bass player as well. So, um, rounded off with uh, Damika Plax, uh, Plakas, is it, on, um, on drums, Playcast. Maybe I was pronouncing him. So apologies for any mispronunciation there. But uh, yeah, what a what a great great album. Um, just really really cool. Um, 
Yeah, another, another album there. I think with the grunge stuff, it, we're going back 30 years now, uh, but I'm still really into it. I've never put something on. Um, even, even the Pearl Jam album, I can listen to that, and it's still, it's still exciting. Well, some of this other stuff is just, just brilliant. Really, really still exciting sounding music, and um, you can see uh, the bands are influencing to, to today. But um, but anyway, number six in my um, uh, grunge ten here is uh, "Smell the Magic" from L Seven, released in nineteen ninety. Right, next up, uh, next band, or one of those bands that people, some people say, "Well, no, they weren't grunge; they weren't part of it." Um, they're, they're from Chicago, uh, but. They were part of the scene in many ways. Um, not so much nowadays, but this album in particular I thought was. It's the Smashing Pumpkins, of course. This was their 1993 release. And at number five in my ten here, Siamese Dream. Um, another that I was listening to when I was travelling. I was in France again for this on a cycle cycle tour. And uh, another one that reminds me of being on the, on the road. I think I feel with a lot of music because I've got such uh, vivid memories of where I heard it. Um that's one of a lot of it sticks for sticks in my mind. But this is brilliant. I just love this. It's um, not only considered um, a great grunge it's considered one of the best indie albums of all time, or one of the best albums ever. It's just uh, it's just up there. So very very highly regarded release. Of course, it was um, the classic lineup: Billy Corgan, uh, leader on guitar; James Ehar on um, guitar; uh, Jimmy Chamberlain on drums; and Darcy Retsky on bass. It was their second album release, and it was just absolutely brilliant. Um, first two tracks in, actually, Cherub Rock and Quiet. So it's a stri- strangely named track, because it's not a very quiet song at all, but they're just two great openers. So you, uh, you've got some good melodic stuff on here, like uh, Today, and um, there's also a, tr- a classic epic on here called Silver Fog, which is a great track, but um, Space Boy, there's some Disarms, a great track, Rocket, so that's some fantastic stuff. I uh, saw them on this tour, um, and uh, it, was, it was actually my gig of the year, I think. Yeah, 1993 was a gig of the year, so I'm on the tour. Yeah, and was, um, just great, great band, great on. And I don't think they bettered it. They went on to different things. I mean, the, the follow up to this was the Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness, which was a double, sprawling double um, album. I think they'd gone beyond being a grunge band at that point. But the, this definitely fits in with that grunge kind of, um, kind of sound. And um, I think it's worthy of its place on this uh, 10 here. So, Siamese Dream from the Smashing Pumpkins. Number five in my grunge 10. Okay. Oh, another one of the big four. <laughs> now, this band... Um, are the one that I think are closest to stepping over into the heavy metal sound. They... Um, they did. They did appear with a lot of. In fact, when I say Nirvana um, turned down the support slot with Guns N' Roses, this band were offered it and they uh, picked it up and uh, went to it. The band is Soundgarden. And it's their uh, third album release from uh, 1991, Bad Motorfinger. Now this is another, along with Pearl Jam's Ten. This is another one I actually bought in Seattle on tape when I was traveling. So this I was also a, um, a travel a travel tape. Uh, I was listening to this a bit more in my earlier travels across um, Canada. So, um, uh, whereas um, Pearl Jam reminds me of um, Toronto and Niagara Falls, and uh, uh, more over on the eastern eastern coast, this was uh, more the uh, the Midwest and uh, my, uh, Quebec as well. Because I actually saw the band. I think I told this story before. I saw the band uh, on this tour when I was in Montreal. So, um, that, that happy memories from my time in Canada with Soundgarden. Bought it on tape, of course, first, and um, ended up. I had it on CD for a while, and then now I've got it on vinyl. But it was brilliant. But yeah, definitely um, one foot in the metal genre on, uh, with, with Soundgarden. It's, um, let's see, the classic. This was there for Ben Shepherd. Oh, there's the band on the back there. Uh, ben Shepherd on the end there. He was, it was his first album with the band. Um, but. Um, just yeah, just great. I mean, it just storms along. It's got some of their best known songs on here. You got Rusty Cage with the track that opens it. Yeah, because when, when I first heard it, um, I've been familiar with a lot of the earlier, with some of the earlier Soundgarden stuff, and uh, I've just bought the tape, put it on the walkman, and listened to it. And the intro to Rusty Cage, like, it doesn't sound like grunge at all. But it just storms into it, and then picks up later, later on. You get Outshined, classic. Um, Jesus, Jesus Christ pose, which is a classic, and yeah, it's just absolutely brilliant. Uh, Search for my good eye closed. Room of the Room a Thousand Years Wide, um, great album. I love the graphics as well. Um, who did the design on that? I can't remember now. Um, 
Mark, Mark Dar um, Darcy, Mark Dancy, can't remember, but yes, lovely little, uh, like a really cool tattoo actually. Mark Dancy was actually, um, he was a musician, he was in another band, I can't remember what the band was called though. But um, this was on a major label, they were on A&M at this point. Soundgarden started life um, with Sub Pop and Seattle, uh, from Seattle. Um, proper proper grunge band, Seattle band, they were on Sub Pop. Then they ended up on AMI, I think they uh, also released an album on the SST label, which is what all the hardcore bands were on. But, yeah, brilliant, very anthemic. Uh, and another album I still listen to and really enjoy to this day. In fact, a lot of these grunge grunge albums, the the, the better ones, I just um, love even more the more I hear them. But anyway, there you go. Number four in my uh, grunge ten here, Soundgarden's Bad Motor Finger. Okay, and to the big three now. Number three now. This came out in 1994, and whatever people think about Courtney Love, um, they can put those things aside when they put this album on. 1994's Live Through This uh, is an absolutely brilliant album in my view. Um, just incredible. Um, there was their second release and uh, they the, um, just, just absolutely nailed it with this. It's one of those perfect albums in my opinion. It's just uh, got great songs, great attitude. Uh, there's a great mix of styles on here. You've got the hard out, screechy, um, grungy sounds. You have uh, tracks like Violet. And um, asking for it, and, and rock star, gutless, you know, some great, great tracks on here. There's a young, young Courtney on the back there. Uh, I can't remember the name of the uh, model who um, featured on that. But, um, anyway, but yeah, just just great. Uh, there was a, there was only Courtney Love and Eric Ilanson from the original album, the, or the original lineup that um, came over for this. This was the first, first to feature. Um, uh, Kristen Pfaff on bass, and I think her, it was her only appearance because she sadly passed away with a drug overdose not long after, and then Patty Schmel on them um, on drums. But uh, it's just a uh, great, great album. Um, it has a strange cover on here as well as a cover of the Young Marble Giants song. Uh, credit in the straight world on side two, which I thought was a, at the time thinking oh, that was a strange, strange thing to cover. Just because you, you just never realise what a lot of these um, artists are listening to, you know, in their early years or growing up. You know, like me, you know, I might release something that's been influenced by something I heard when I was a teenager, and uh, but very unlikely. But um, well, there you go. But anyway, yeah, Holes lived through this is a, just a fantastic album. Can't I can't um, can't say much more than that really. It's uh, well worthy of its number three slot on here. So um, here we go from uh, 1994. Live through this. Oh, Nirvana have got to be on this list, and uh, I've already had a uh, Nirvana album ranking, so everyone will know which my favourite Nirvana album is. Well, anyone who saw that video would. Anyway, it's uh, Bleach, 1989. So uh, I'll check out my uh, Nirvana ranking if you want to find out more about this. Uh, it's uh, just brilliant. So I'm a sub-pop label, it was the, the one released before Nevermind, of course. It's got the, the proper raw sound of their grunge sort of roots, really. It's the, the only one to feature Chad Channing on drums, so it's obviously before Dave Grohl joined. But it is just brilliant. You know, you've got Blue, Floyd the Barber, Barrel of Girl, School, Love Buzz, Paper Cuts, Negative Creep. That's side one. You know, side one just gets even better, it's just brilliant. It's absolutely a great album. Produced by uh, Jack Endino. Released in 1989, and um, my favourite Nirvana album. It's number two on my grunge ten, but could possibly be number one really. But um, I've got, I've got, um, I've got one. The, the one I chose for number one, you'll see just in a, a couple of seconds. Um, and I'll, I'll explain why I've chosen that. So anyway, there we go. 1989's Bleach by Nirvana is number two on my uh, grunge ten. Want to know more about my thoughts on this? Check out my Nirvana video. Number one is, in my opinion, where it all kind of started. It's where it all started for me without me realising it. Um, I saw this band on the, on their 1989 tour in Europe, and they were touring this this EP, um, which later got expanded into an album, like a lot of these things do. This is the original EP. Six tracks. The band is Mud Honey, and the album is Super Fuzz Big Muff. 
which is number one in my grunge. And the reason, and I think it's because this is when I first kind of twigged onto it without, like, although without even realizing I was uh, getting into grunge. <coughs> I saw Mama Tour and heard this, and that was it. I was hooked. Um, they were supporting Sonic Youth, so um, you can imagine that'd be a great night. That was. I think it was my gig of the year for 1989. This came out in '88. Like I say, it's an EP, so you've got six tracks on it. It was expanded later to um, feature, I think, their early singles. And I think it was called um, Super 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 Fuzz Big Muff Plus Singles or something. I'll just sort of stray a little longer titles. But this this is a um, just, just got singles on this one. Really, really cool. I mean, you can you can hear the the sound of um, lots of all the other bands in here, really, particularly in Nirvana. Um, you got the the quiet, the quiet, loud dynamic going on. You got slower, grun slower, sludgier numbers. Of course, the, uh, the EP's title comes from um, a portmanteau of their two favourite guitar effects pedals, the Super Fuzz and the Big Muff. And that that's what that's kind of like where the the grunge sound came from, really. Um, there's an interesting thing on the the final track on here. There's a track called "In and Out of Grace," and it opens up with a clip from the film uh, "The Wild Angels." Uh, Peter Fonda's eulogy from there, which in a slightly different version uh, was also used by um, Primal Scream on their track Loaded on um, Scream of Delica back uh, later in, um, what was that, 1991, was it? a little bit later, so it was quite interesting hearing that again, I do someone else has used that before, it's just a slightly different um, edit of the clip, but, um, <coughs> but great, I mean from the opening track of Need, this is just br brilliant. Brilliant EP and um, part of history, I'd say. Part of history, part, certainly part of my history. But anyway, there we go. That's my Grunge Ten number one, Mud Honey, Super Fuzz, Big Mug, Big Muff from 1988. Right, sorry about the coughing there. A bit of a dry throat today. It's supposed to be spring arriving here in New Zealand, but it's uh, still a little bit up and down with the weather. Anyway, we don't need a weather forecast from me, so um, there we go. Right, okay, that's my uh, Grunge Ten. Hope everyone found that interesting. Entertaining, maybe. Grungy, maybe. My sore throat. Okay, so um, there's more stuff coming soon, so um, stay tuned. Um, as usual, thank you for being there. Hope you enjoyed that, and I'll say bye for now. <laughs>